Praise the Lord. So happy to have you in the worship service this morning. And I pray that the Lord will enrich and bless every life in Jesus' name. I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because I know there will be mighty blessings for my soul. There will be mighty blessings for you today in Jesus' name. I know you have heard about the retreat. How many of you have heard about the retreat? And you are planning to be there. You'll be there in Jesus' name. This time I cannot begin to tell you the great blessings the Lord will shower upon your life. Every prayer you have ever prayed, bottled up in the bottle of God in heaven, the abundance, the showers will be poured upon your life right there. Resurrection power. Everything in your life will revive. Resurrection will come upon your life. Your wife, your husband. I'm going to start to give, give a good evening for your wife. I said for your wife and for your husband, for all your children and for your parents, for all our brothers and sisters who are going to participate and for all our invitees. There will be blessing from the time you step at DLCC, Deep and Life Conference Center. Blessings upon blessings in Jesus' name. You must be there. This one is not publicity. This one is penetration into your life. The Lord will bless everyone in Jesus' name. And in our service today, the service is made just for you. The Lord will bless every life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today. We bless your name for your people. Thank you for the joy of the Lord and for the joy of service. I pray, Lord, everyone today, those who are newcomers and those who have been old timers, you will bless everyone in Jesus' name. Take sorrow away from every heart and take problem away from every life. And Lord, set us free that will serve you in a rewardable service in Jesus' name. Bless your people, Lord, abundantly. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're reading from Romans chapter 12. And I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. At the end of verse 1, you have one, one word there. It talks about service. It talks about service. And then it talks about your reasonable service as you think about life and you think about the believer the believer's life is a life of service actually we serve and we are served that is the world we live everyone around us is meant to serve us everything around us it's about, it's, a, it's meant to serve us. We receive more service than we can ever render. Think about that. As you look about your life from the time you were born until this time. And from this time until you will go to see the Lord in the great beyond. We receive more service than we can ever render. We are served by all. We're served by people we know, 
were served by people we don't know. The farmers who are toiling on the field and the farm, they're toiling to serve us. The food vendors who are processing the food, packaging the food, and they bring to our doorstep, they're serving us. Our parents, from the time we were born, they have been serving us, our helpers, help us in every way, help us in the home, help us on the street, help us in the school, help us in the corporation where we're working. They're serving us. Think about the dressmakers. What would you be and where could you go without the dressmakers? Those dressmakers are serving us. Think about our teachers, our teachers from kindergarten to primary and to secondary and to a higher level. All our teachers are serving us. Our neighbors are serving us. Think about our telephone system. Think about telecommunication. The service providers are serving us. What I'm saying is in life. Everybody around is serving us. The people we know, they're serving us. And the people we don't know, they're serving us. Go beyond that. The Almighty God is serving us. He's sending rain and sunshine. The Almighty God is serving us. He has given His only begotten Son so that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus Christ served us. He sacrificed His life for us. He is now at the right hand of God and is making His intercession for us. The Holy Ghost is serving us, is teaching us, is guiding us, is comforting us, is showing us the way. Even the angels are meant to be serving us. And our brothers and sisters, our pastors, our Sunday scripture teachers, and the people that make us understand the way of life, they are serving us. Our singers are serving us. Our ushers are serving us. Security people, they are serving us. All the people around us, the people we know their names and the people we don't know their names and the people who are behind the curtain and they are rendering their faithful service. Think about it. More people are serving you than you can ever serve. That's the reason why as we come together and we think about the service we receive, now we also ought to think of the service we render. And God is going to reward us eternally for the service we render. He will reward you in Jesus' name. That's why today we're looking at this message, the believer's eternally rewardable service on earth. The believers, they're still on earth and they're serving and their service is eternally rewardable. The believers eternally rewardable service on earth. Three things we're looking at. Number one, transforming the mind before acceptable service to Christ. Transforming the mind before acceptable service to Christ. Number two, training ministers for ascending service to Christians. Ministers who are serving us in the church, they're serving us as Christians, the, their service cannot be at a standstill. It has to be progressing and ascending and getting better and improving and they are training themselves for that training ministers for ascending service to Christians. Number three, teachable members with active sanctification in character. Teachable mem members with active sanctification. It's not a dormant sanctification. It's not a quiet sanctification. It's not a superficial sanctification. It's not an idle sanctification. It's a sanctification that is active. And you can see the service that members are supposed to render. Teachable members with active sanctification in character. Number one, transforming the mind before acceptable service to Christ. Come back to Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Number one, you see people here who have experienced the grace of God. They have experienced the cleansing in the blood of the Lamb. They are referred to as brethren. Number two, you can see the evidence. It's not just that I say I'm a brother. It's not, not just that to say you're a sister. In reality, we can see because of what you offer unto Christ and by extension, what you offer unto believers. And then we have some examples of the people who have done it creditably well. Paul, the apostle that wrote this epistle, it's done that. He couldn't be telling the believers that you will render acceptable service to God and he himself was rendering unacceptable service. He was a good example. Look at this, number one, the experience of a transformed mind. The experience of a transformed mind. He's talking to brethren who had the experience that their minds have been transformed and he still wanted further transformation in their mind. Number two, the evidence of a transformed mind. The evidence of a transformed mind. And number three, the examples of a transformed mind. Number one, the experience of he transformed my come back to that verse one again i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god i beseech you brethren by the mercies of god what mercy is that and what did they get by that mercy it's telling us of the experience of a transformed mind i'm looking at ephesians chapter 2 ephesians chapter 2 and we're reading from verses 4 and 5. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy for his great love, where we the love does, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. We received mercy and we received salvation. It's not by marriage. That's why Paul the Apostle is saying, because you have got the experience of a transformed mind through the mercies of God, now offer yourself into service unto the Lord. Look at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 5. By the mercies of God, the mercy that saved us. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. According to his mercy, he saved us. And Paul the Apostle is saying, have you experienced the mercy of God? Has the Lord touched your life and transformed your mind? By that mercy that brought salvation, you should be so grateful to God that you offer yourself a living sacrifice unto God. Look at First Peter chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, according to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He sent Jesus Christ. He died for you, for me, for us on the cross of Calvary. He was buried. He rose again. And because of that resurrection, resurrection power has come into our lives and we are saved according to his abundant mercy. Abundant mercy. And now he says, because of that mercy, 
let there be transformation because of that mercy let there be contribution to the service of the lord in first peter chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 10 first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 10 which in time past were not a people but now are the people of god which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy it tells us salvation has come by the mercy of god and all the people that have gone to calvary spiritually all the people that have looked up to christ and they say i know i'm a sinner and i cannot save myself but I praise God for his mercy that he sent Jesus Christ to save me. Those people, their sins are forgiven. Their lives are cleansed. And things are turned around. And then Paul the Apostle is saying, because of that mercy that you have received, present your life, present your body, a living sacrifice. What's the evidence that we have got this transformed life number two the evidence of a transformed mind the evidence of a transformed mind we're looking at first timothy chapter one and verse 13 first timothy chapter one verse 13 who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy. Here is the evidence. He said, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, with, which is in Christ. This is a faithful sin and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. That's the manifestation of the mercy. And Paul, the apostle, says, I received mercy. And I'm an example of the people that have got the mercy of God. He says, of whom I'm chief, how be it for this cause I obtained mercy. That in me, first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. He got mercy. I received mercy. I said, I received mercy. When you got saved, you received mercy. When the Lord forgave your sin, you receive mercy. When the Lord changed your life and wrote your name in the book of life, you received mercy. You must remember the time. You must remember the day. You must remember the date. You must remember the circumstances. And you must remember what took place in your heart. How you poured out your heart to God in repentance, asking for forgiveness. And how the favor of God, the mercy of God, and the salvation of God came into your soul. You must remember that time. It happened instantaneously at a moment of time. If you cannot remember, you need to go to the cross and go to Calvary. If you are just in the church, because I was, I've, I've always been a Christian, I was born in a Christian family, and I've always known the Bible, I always believe there's God. That, that's different, that's different. Even the devils believe and they tremble. For this mercy, this one is specific, and this one is definite. You must know the day, you must know the time, you must know the how, and you must know the when the Lord saved you. And you received in a definite way the mercy of God and the salvation of God. And the evidence was there. Galatians chapter 1 verse 23. Galatians chapter 1 verse 23. It says, but they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which he once destroyed. That's the evidence I got mercy. That's the evidence I received salvation. That's the evidence of a transformed mind that mercy had come to my life. That the things I used to do, I do that no more. He was a persecutor. 
a moment came a moment of turning around a moment of transformation he now became a preacher a persecutor in the past and now a preacher there is evidence of a changed life look at this first corinthians chapter 6 and i'm reading from verse 9 first corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 it says in verse 9 know ye not that your righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of god be not deceived neither fornicators no idolaters no adulterers no effeminate no abusers of themselves with mankind men and men doing fleshly things together women and women doing fleshly things together homosexuality it says the abusers of themselves with mankind thieves no covetous no drunkards no revilers no extortioners none of them shall inherit the kingdom of god and such were pastor some of you but ye are washed but ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god that's the evidence of a transformed mind it says this is who you were and this is what you were and this is what you are now there is a difference and that is the difference the world is looking for in every life that says i'm a transformed man i'm a transformed woman the people who are working with you in the office they want to know you are a transformed person in your community you are self-centered you are selfish and you are self-exalting but now you are self-effacing you don't want to be seen humility has come in a change of life has come in there is the evidence of a transformed mind look at first thessalonians chapter one first thessalonians chapter one reading from verse six and he became you are not like this before but you became you became a transformation has taken place you became a change has happened you became a new life has replaced the old life the evidence of a transformed mind and ye became followers of us and of the lord have you received the word in much affliction with joy of the holy ghost so that ye were examples to all that believe in macedonia and achaia for from you sounded out the word of the lord not only in macedonia and achaia but also in every place your faith to god word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything look at verse 9 for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you how ye turned to god the evidence how ye turned to god the evidence of a transformed mind how ye turned to god from idols to serve the living and true god and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come you see the evidence in those thessalonians they received the word of god they received the grace of god they received the mercy of god and life was no longer the same their character was no longer the same their heart was no longer the same their interaction and behavior in society was no longer the same i must ask you what is the evidence of a transformed life in your life can you tell the day can you tell the date can you tell the time when you are 
instantaneously transformed and changed and you were saved can you tell the difference between the light and darkness and can you tell the dawn of the day of conversion in your life that you can say that was the day i had number one the experience of a transformed life that was the time number two i had the evidence of a transformed life look at luke chapter 19 and i read from verse 8 luke chapter 19 I'm reading from verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold evidence the evidence of a transformed mind he was stingy before he was greedy before everything must come his direction before and he will grab it by force if you don't give him by a freely and he said everything i've done i am making restitution regeneration has taken place righteousness has come in and restitution will be the evidence that there is a change there is a transformation in verse 9 and jesus said unto him this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he is also a son of abraham for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost number one the experience of a transformed mind number two is the evidence of a transformed mind number three the examples of a transformed mind the examples of a transformed mind i've shown you two examples already the example of paul the apostle a change came a transformation came a turning around came and he was no longer the same person he used to be ask yourself is the change that has come in your life evident the transformation that has come in your life evident is it evident to you yourself is it evident to your wife is it evident to your husband is it evident to your children is it evident to your parents that a change has taken place and even your neighbors can tell from that day from that time that that man that woman went to that meeting he came back and he's no more she's no more the same he's no more the same can they tell of the experience of a transformed mind can they tell of the evidence the change they can see everybody could see it in Saul that became Paul everybody could hear it from Zacchaeus that said of my good I give to the poor and if I take anything by false accusation I restore him fourfold have you made restitution in your life looking at your past look at the things you stole from people you stole somebody's wife you took somebody's husband and now you've got women that you just lined up number one number two number three now that you say you are transformed where is the transformation have you returned the extra women to where they belong and then the certificate you stole the money you stole and the property you stole from other people have you restored them where is the evidence of a transformed mind the examples of a transformed mind examples of a transformed mind we're looking at philippians chapter 2 reading from verse 3 philippians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 3 
let nothing be done through strife of inglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. That's the example. When you can look at other people and you can see areas they are better. I need to learn something from him. I need to learn something from her. And you're not looking down at everybody every time. They can teach me nothing. They can contribute nothing to my life. I am the all in all. And I am the exalted one in the midst of millions of people. But no, a transformation has taken place now. That you are not putting yourself on that high tower anymore. And it says in verse 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. When your own mind, your native mind, your natural mind is taken away. And the mind of Christ is given unto you. Is that possible? It says there, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Look at uh, First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That he may instruct him. Look at this. But we have the mind of Christ. Examples. We have the mind of Christ. It's the mind of lowliness. It's the mind of meekness. It's the mind of a quiet and meek spirit. It's a mind of wanting to honor the Lord, glorify the Lord every time in everything philippians chapter 3 i'm reading from verse 15 philippians chapter 3 verse 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect as many as be matured as many as have been cleansed by the blood of the lord of the lamb be thus minded and if in any sin ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained by salvation, by spiritual growth, by increase in knowledge, by dedication to the Lord, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. First Peter chapter 4, I read from verse 1. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, and Christ sacrificed everything. Arm yourself with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That's not talking about Christ because Christ never sinned. It's talking about you. It's talking about me. It's talking about the believers. And if we have suffered in the flesh, if we have been persecuted because of our faith in the Lord, we'll stop from sinning. And the people have realized we're no longer sinners. We're saints of God. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God, transforming the mind before acceptable service to Christ. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, those who have the experience of transformation, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, those who have the evidence of transformation, 
I beseech you therefore brethren those who have become an example of a transformed mind I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies you present your bodies it's not an option can I be a Christian, a believer, and not present my body to God? No. Can I be a Christian, and can I be a lonely Christian, a lone ranger, and not present my sacrifice to God? No. If you have received mercy, you want to spread that mercy. You want to tell other people about that mercy. It says that you present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy. Is holiness op op uh, an option? No. It's for everyone holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That's what salvation makes us to be different from the world, distinct from the world. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove. What is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God? Point number two now, training ministers for ascending service to Christians. Training ministers for ascending service, increasing service, upgraded service, better service, higher service, Unto other Christians, look at verse 6. Having then gifts differing to the grace, according to the grace that is given to us. Having gifts differing. Have you remembered? Can you recollect all those who are serving us in the world and in the church? They have differing gifts according to the grace that is given unto them and you see all those service providers they are always improving on themselves improving themselves look at those who teach us in a primary school secondary school and higher institution they have to go for training and they're reading journals and they're going for conferences why they're upgrading their knowledge so they can teach better look at the doctors who treat us they provide service to us and after they have gone through the initial training of so many years for them to be up to date so that every is not you know everything that comes they just say i know what to do i know what to prescribe they are always updating themselves and look at the builders the builders those who are building our houses and all the sanctuaries they have to be upgrading themselves every time look at the media personnel the media personnel whether they walk in the radio or the print media or internet or anywhere they have to go for training and they have to be upgrading themselves even the government officials who are serving us look at the pilots who are, who are piloting uh, the plane they have to go for training they are serving us and look at all the others they are always improving their service always improving their service to keep our interest and to keep our patronage if we know that you know those pilots are just the same as they were 10 years ago we'll rather look for another plane to take us where we want to go if we know that those doctors are the same as they were 15 years ago when they came out of the med medical school we we'll look for another hospital another doctor all the service providers in the world they're always upgrading always increasing always training now those of us who are in the church and we're ministering to Christians and we're ministering to other people we are ministers who are training ourselves for ascending service unto Christians let's come to uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 6 having then gives differing according to the grace that is given to us whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. 
If you have little faith, you're going to prophesy according to little faith. If you have increasing faith, you're going to prophesy according to that increasing faith. And if you have, uh, you know, the mountain moving faith, you're going to prophesy and preach and proclaim according to that mountain moving faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Let us read about the ministry. Let us study about the ministry. Let us improve about our ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. He that teaches on teaching. That's one of our teachers there. We listened to him 10 years ago. And we're listening to him today. And there is no difference at all. The same thing that you would say 10 years ago, he'll take he'll take uh, that outline he will be he glue his face on the outline like we'll do 10 years ago when we start when he started teaching he'll glue his face on the page and we'll be reading and reading and reading and they will not deviate from anything he's reading there and there is uh, no intuition there's no inspiration there's no illustration there is no freedom and he's not talking to the people he's not ministering to the people he's a teacher but he's not waiting on his teaching ministry is not improving on his teaching ministry or he that exhorts an exhortation he that giveth let him do it with simplicity he that ruleth with diligence he that shows mercy with cheerfulness three things number one daily consecration for better service daily consecration for better service whatever service you render whatever area you are ministering that area is very important and need for remove that area of your ministry there'll be a great vacuum and because you know god appointed you and god put you there and you're giving something to the body which nobody else at that time can give to the body you are daily consecrating yourself for better service number two deliberate crucifixion for better service deliberate crucifixion when self was alive and not crucified when the old man was alive and not and not crucified your service will be as the people respond as the people react if the people are not happy with you your service is not also going on straight there is friction in your service and there is deliberate withdrawal in your service they are not happy i'm not happy too and they're going to go hungry today of the bread of life but you know you deliberately crucify yourself so you can render better service unto the lord number three deeper consciousness of the best service deeper consciousness of the best service after you have served the people of god you go back to your closet your chamber and you examine yourself is there something better than i've rendered is there the best somewhere i can still give there's deeper consciousness of the best service number one daily consecration for better service we're looking at acts of the apostles chapter chapter 18 acts chapter 18 and i'm reading from verse 24 and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the lord knowing only the baptism of john and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue whom when aquila and priscilla heard they took him unto themselves and expounded unto him the way of god more perfectly Look at that man. Look at Apollos. As we look at him, we're told, number one, he was already an eloquent man. 
eloquent man. He was given his best. And they were told he was mighty in the scriptures. They were told he was instructed in the way of the Lord. And they were told he was fervent in spirit. Were told when he came on stage that he taught the people diligently. They were told this limitation only knowing up to the baptism of John. And in verse 26, when he spoke, he spoke boldly in the synagogue. He was, but he was consecrated to offer better service to the people of God. Are you like that? If you're already good, if you're already eloquent, if you're already mighty, if you're already forceful, if you're already fervent, do you consecrate yourself? Wait on your ministry, wait on your ministry, and study for improvement so that if Aquila and Priscilla comes along, they can expand the word of God unto you more perfectly. Daily consecration for better service. Number two, deliberate crucifixion. Deliberate crucifixion so that you can render better service. As you are coming to render service to the people of God and you see there is self that is trying to raise up its ugly head again in me or in you and then you take that to the cross before you came to minister, before you come to minister to the people of God so that that self that old man that self-consciousness will die again look at first corinthians chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 31 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 31 i protest by your rejoicing which i have in christ in christ jesus our lord i die daily i die daily when I come to a new day, I'm a teacher. When I come to a new day, I'm a minister. And I saw what I taught yesterday and what I ministered yesterday. What, when I come to a new day as a service provider and I saw what I provided yesterday, I don't come with the fact that that was great. Everybody knew that was great. I've offered the best I can ever offer. I come to the new day and I die daily. I die to the success of yesterday. I die to the service I provided yesterday. It's a new day. It's a new opportunity. And I need to provide something better than I've given in the past daily deliberate crucifixion for better service in galatians chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 20 galatians chapter 2 verse 20 i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i but christ liveth in me and the life which i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me i'm always looking at the example of jesus christ and i'm stretching and i'm reaching out i am pursuing I want to be like him and because I'm always stretching and looking forward I want to render better service unto the Lord and that requires deliberate crucifixion number three deeper consciousness for the best deeper consciousness for the best I'm looking at others who have ministered before me I'm looking at others, my contemporaries who are giving something greater, something higher. I'm looking at the angels of God that give unto the Lord a service that you cannot blame, a service that is blameless. And I'm conscious every time in a deeper sense of the best of services I can render unto the Lord. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 31, but covet earnestly the best gifts. 
covet honestly the best gifts or if you have the gift already and then you see now to make use of that gift in a better way in the best way that to reach the minds of the people and be a blessing unto the people god sent service providers in the church you are god sent service provider if you fold your hand how are we going to benefit from the service the lord has deposited in you that you're going to offer to the body of christ god sent service providers in the church must keep on improving so that their service to God's people will benefit more people. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approach unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God will help us. God will help you. You render better service to the Lord and you have a deeper consciousness of the best service you can render to the people of God. We come to point number three now. Teachable members with active sanctification in character. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. I read from verse 9. It says, let love be without dissimulation this part this passage is talking about our character both in the church as well as outside the church both in the flock and in our family it's about our character and it's about love three things say number one love in sincerity love in sincerity there's no dissimulation there is no hypocrisy there is no pretense love in sincerity number two love for all saints and sinners love for all saints and sinners number three love through assured sanctification love through active sanctification love through affectionate sanctification you can tell that there is a kind of love that is coming out of, okay, I have to do it, then I do it. Okay, if I don't do it now, all eyes are looking at me, and so grudgingly, I rise up, I do it. But that's a kind of love Some coming from a sanctified heart. Whatever pressure the believer is going through, whatever opposition the believer is going through, whatever private problems he may have, all that does not matter. He manifests his love with active, assured, affectionate sanctification. Number one, love in all sincerity. Look at verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. You've got a second nature that your nature will normally repel that which is evil, that which is false, that which is not real, that which is of the flesh, that which is of the devil. Be kindly affectioned one to another. The kindness has become a second nature because of the nature of Christ in you. And he says, we're brotherly love in honor preferring one another. There's an opportunity for you and the other person to step back. Brother, go ahead. Sister, go ahead. No, it's yours. You are my senior. You know more than I know. At this time, let us leave it like that, my brother. Go ahead and take the opportunity in honor. You are preferring another. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Everything you are to do, you count it as service unto the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer the sincerity in your love in philippians chapter one philippians chapter one reading from verses 10 
and 11. Verses 10 and 11. That she may approve things that are excellent. That she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That she may be sincere. There's no hypocrisy. There's no dissimulation. You're sincere in everything you do. If you smile, it's sincere. If you laugh, it's sincere. If you give, it's sincere. If you counsel, it's sincere. If you lift up somebody, it's sincere. If you give honor to another person, it's sincere. Everything that you do is in all sincerity, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, that which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Let's come back to Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 13. Love for all saints and love for all sinners. It tells us in Romans chapter 12 and reading from verse 13, distributing to the necessity of the saints if you have material things like clothing like food like accommodation whatever it is you have that other people need your love is to all saints there's no discrimination that one is coming from the north that one is coming from the south that's one is coming from my state that one is coming from my tribe you're generous to everyone and you're distributing to the need of everyone giving to hospitality you are sold out to hospitality if you see any need somewhere that a member of the church has you are sold out to wanting to do and wanting to give bless them that persecute you here are sinners now they don't understand your way of life here are sinners they don't understand your commitment and consecration and because of that they persecute you you're saying God bless you and you mean that and you mean that if you knew what I knew what I know you'll not be persecuting me if you have the spirit that I have you'll not be persecuting me if you have gone to Calvary like I went to Calvary and a change came in my life you'll not be doing what you're doing you pity them because they do not have the light you have that's why they persecute you and so you bless them bless and curse not you don't curse people even in your mind even in your thoughts even in your prayer even in the private or in the public or on the pulpit or anywhere you are or in your family you bless and you curse not rejoice with them that do rejoice they didn't rejoice with me when I had a moment of joy. That's not important for a child of God. If they are rejoicing, whatever they have been, whatever they have not been, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Was he weeping about? That thing happened to me before and I didn't weep. That thing happened to me before and I summed up courage and I denied myself and it happened in the morning and I kept on serving the Lord from afternoon to evening. You don't talk like that, don't think like that. That thing is painful for him. That thing is making him cry or weep. You weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. You are serving the Lord with such a love for all saints. And the saints of God can depend on you. Anytime they see you, they know that help has come. Anytime they see you, they know that blessing has come to them. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. We're looking at verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 3. Remember them which are in bonds, as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being also in the same body as if you were the one suffering what you would have thought what you would have desired that others will do to you you will do to them one there is love in all sincerity 
two, there is love for all saints and for all sinners. Three, there's love through sanctification. We're looking at um, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Somebody has done evil to you. The temptation will not even come in your mind. I'll throw it back to him. He threw much at me. I'm going to throw iron, wood, stone, injurious metal unto him. No, it doesn't come in your mind. A saved soul, a sanctified heart, recompense to no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men, all men. Some of them are low, some of them are high. Some of them are loving, some of them are hateful. Some of them are tribalistic and some of them are normal. All men are whatever they do and whatever they provide and however they might appear to hurt you it says you provide things honest in the sight of all men if it be possible as much as lies in you live peaceably with all men that means conflict will not start from you fighting will not start from you the ceremony discord will not start from you and if it starts from them, it takes two to make a fight. If he raises up his hand and you put up your hand, if he frowns and you smile, if he pushes you and then you look back with a loving smile as well as a soothing voice, how about you to our friends now? Why did that happen? fight will not continue if you don't take it to heart i hear this i hear that they did this they did that how could anybody do that and you're not defending yourself all right we're going to defend you as much as this lies in you live peaceably with all men that they be loved avenge not yourselves let there be no war let there be no fighting, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if an enemy hunger, feed him, not with poison, with good, nourishing food. If he thirst, give him drink, not in a dirty glass of in a dirty glass or cup but in clean good glass it says for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head you burn fire into his conscience be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good let the just say amen Anywhere I go, say it after me. Anywhere I go, I will overcome evil with good. You'll overcome evil with good in Jesus' name. That's the holiness the Lord has called us to. And I pray that that holiness will be in your heart, will be in your mind, will be on your tongue will be in your mouth, will be in your appearance, will be in your response to people, will be in your reaction to people, and will go with you every day and everywhere in your life in Jesus' name. Great will be your reward. On earth, God will reward you. In heaven, God will reward you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 follow peace with how many people with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord i pray you will see the lord on the final day here in life while you are praying you will see the lord your place of work you will see the lord in your family you will see the lord 
every time you desire something to come from heaven open windows from heaven you will see the lord anywhere you go everywhere you go till the end of your life and if it so happens you are going to leave before the rapture takes place in heaven or at that point when you are crossing over you'll see the lord in jesus name there'll be no regret at the time of your living and i'll be not looking back if i had known at the time you're leaving you'll see the lord saying i am with you come over and you'll get over to heaven in jesus name and for all eternity you will see the lord follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord i will see the lord Rise up and tell the Lord. You want to see the Lord on the final day? Rise up and tell the Lord. He has told us that we should have transformation. Transformation. A transformed mind. And there should be the experience of that transformed mind. There should be the evidence of that transformed mind. You should be an example of that transformation of mind. And as we are serving the Lord and serving the people of God, daily consecration, deliberate crucifixion, deeper consciousness of rendering better service and the best of services to the Lord. And let your love be sincere. Let your love be for all sins and all sinners. Let your love come out every time with active sanctification.